features of two different disorders even though they are considered to be subtypes of each other but two different disorders one is a pituitary apoplexy and second one is a Sheehan syndrome second one is a Sheehan syndrome I already told you even though Sheehan is considered as a subtype of or maybe a sub classification of apoplexy only but a lot of authors consider this as a separate entity because I'll tell you why so first you have to know the etiology of pituitary apoplexy the etiology of pituitary apoplexy is very simple it's going to be most commonly due to a macro adenoma most commonly it will be a pituitary macro adenoma that's screwing up its own blood supply which means that can result in a hemorrhage or an infarction so pituitary macro adenoma that's screwing up its own blood supply either it can result in a hemorrhage into the pituitary or it can uh, because the massive size of the macro adenoma it can compromise its own blood supply and again screw up and can go for infarction edema and inflammation in the local area it's fine so this is the usual reason apart from that you can result in apoplexy due to uncontrolled hypertension causing bleeding into the pituitary especially this is common if the patient has associated diabetes mellitus or if the patient goes for a DIC descendant intracellular coagulation causing bleeding into the pituitary if you have studied DIC due to meningeal septicemia causing hemorrhage into the adrenal glands is called as waterhouse Friedrichen syndrome but here the DIC might happen and because of some sepsis and that might result in hemorrhage into the pituitary or very rarely it might be due to traumatic causes but these are not common so the most common will be always the macro adenoma screwing up its blood supply causing hemorrhage or infarction of the pituitary clear Sheehan syndrome is going to happen only in the postpartum woman is going to happen only in the postpartum woman that is due to severe postpartum hemorrhage causing hypotension causing hypertension clear postpartum women due to severe postpartum hemorrhage causing hypertension all right so what is the mechanism 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 of apoplexy i told you it is either a hemorrhage into the pituitary that's a usual phenomenon or it can be even a necrosis due to infarction necrosis infarction of the pituitary clear necrosis infarction of the pituitary that is due to variable reasons i told you already it's necrosis or infarction causing inflammation edema of the pituitary but on the other hand Sheehan syndrome is only due to infarction postpartum infarction or necrosis of the pituitary it's not a hemorrhage it's only a necrosis or infarction of the pituitary but it will happen only in postpartum and I told you only if it happens in postpartum due to PPH you are going to call it as Sheehan syndrome but here the patients will not have history of this postpartum period in the exam so this, it's not a postpartum disease it's a postpartum disease causing infection necrosis typically Sheehan syndrome only and why category they are affecting only the postpartum woman, not any other one now like the reason is because if you take this a normal pituitary in the postpartum period i'm going to have something like this which means there will be hypertrophy of the anteriority and especially one important area is going to get hypertrophy that is a lactotrophs this lactotrophs are the mammotrophs are the ones that will be seriously hypertrophied in the uh, postpartum period or in the peripartum period at least during the parturition and during the third trimester this lactotroph is going to hypertrophy like anything that is because they have to secrete prolactin which is needed to produce the breast milk that has to support the child newborn child it's very very important so that's why they go for hypertrophy and that is the reason suppose if i am having a, a normal patient is having a hypotension and shock it has very least effect on the pituitary it doesn't have any much effects but a postpartum woman due to postpartum hemorrhage causing hypotension and shock is very significant because this pituitary needs a very high blood supply but this hypotension can compromise this pituitary's blood supply and they can go for infarction and necrosis and who's going to be the maximally affected one that's the lactotrophs other areas will be minimally only affected but this lactotrophs are the ones that are going to be maximally affected and it's a very subacute process we'll discuss in the next point so you know clinical feature like presentation wise it's going to be very acute in presentation but whereas your uh, Sheehan syndrome is going to be more subacute to chronic which means it will not be dramatic presentation it will be more of a subacute to chronic presentation so in the sense what will be the first sign 
clinical feature or clinical sign of a Sheehan syndrome if somebody asks you definitely you are going to answer it is lactational failure because the lactotrophs are the first that are going to be affected because of the because they are the ones that need more blood supply and they are the ones that are more prone for necrosis in the postpartum period due to hypotension so that is really important and lactation failure is often going to be the first evidence of a Sheehan syndrome and it's very subacute it's not going to present like you know like very dramatic like headache visual field defects and mass effects like how apoplexy will present which I'll go to discuss so second plus or minus the Sheehan syndrome patients may have other hormone deficiencies also other hormone deficiencies for example they may have a low growth hormone they may have a low gonadotropins in the form of reduced FSH and LH which can result in amenorrhea over a long period of time more than expected after pregnancy they can have a low TSH you know, like because of that they will have a low T4 resulting in a central hypothyroidism like picture they may also have a low ACTH which means they can have a low cortisol making a secondary adrenal insufficiency picture so they can have adrenal insufficiency also and they are more prone for hypotension and shock because they have low cortisol they cannot support these patients in times of stress because cortisol is a very important hormone during stressful scenarios so they can go for shock during stressful states clear but the first sign is almost always a lactational failure in a Sheehan syndrome but apoplexy is something different they will be more dramatic in presentation and it's one of the neurosurgical emergencies where they are going to present with mass effects of the pituitary. So whenever pituitary is going to produce mass effects, you have a lot of non-specific signs and you have some specific or at least a relatively specific sign with respect to the pituitary. What are the non-specific signs of any mass effect? So obviously it's going to be the headache and in apoplexy, the most common clinical feature will be the headache only sudden acute onset headache very very important that is not seen in Sheehan syndrome at all it's very subacute you don't have a headache but here you can definitely have a headache which is going to be the most common clinical feature apart from that they might have a nausea and vomiting and which is also is going to come under non-specific mass effect that is due to rise ICP and specific with respect to the pituitary you have to know a little bit of anatomy about it so you know this is the cella and you know here is where your pituitary is and this is where your optic chiasma is and you have a cavernous sinus all right so on the either side you're going to have a cavernous sinus and this cavernous sinus is having a lot of blood and it's going to communicate with each other as well all right so this is going to communicate with each other also and you have a lot of nerves that are suspended in the cavernous sinus you have third nerve fourth nerve fifth nerve five one five two six lot of nerves are there except the mandibular nerve that three four you know like uh, five six complex a lot of them are going to be suspended in the cavernous sinus and you also have a internal carotid artery all right so you also have internal carotid artery that is suspended in the cavernous sinus only this is the cavernous portion of the internal carotid artery there is a separate entity called cavernous portion of the internal carotid artery where they are located in the cavernous sinus so anything that affects the pituitary for example let me say there is some problem in the pituitary that is causing enlargement of the pituitary area which means the first that is going to compress is the central portion of the chiasma so which means the central crossing fiber central chiasma will be affected so first they are going to affect the central chiasma will be compressed so it's called central chiasmal compression number one and second they can go and compress on the cavernous sinus associated nerves also that's also possible. So these are the two things that you're going to get. So what are the features of a central chiasmal lesion? So whenever you get a central chiasmal lesion or a central optic chiasmal compression, you are going to get a very characteristic type of visual field defect. Obviously, it will result in a visual field defect. And what is the characteristic type of a visual field defect you're going to get? That is called a bitemporal hemianopia. Remember, we have a whole lot of discussion on this uh, visual field effects but right now I'm going to discuss only a relatively specific thing for pituitary that is bitemporal menopia but we have a separate discussion in the central nervous system where what are the different types of visual field effects and how will you approach a visual field effect but right now trust me central chiasmal lesion will result in a bitemporal menopia but remember in this itself you have to see whether what is the pattern of bitemporal menopia 
whether it is superior loss more than inferior loss or inferior loss is more than the superior loss. Why this is important? Because you can see that pituitary lesions, expanding pituitary lesions will affect the optic chiasma from the bottom which means the inferior fibers are affected more. For example, if I zoom in and show you, you can see pituitary is going to affect the inferior fibers more. Remember these inferior fibers carry the superior world and the superior fibers in the optic tract is going to carry the inferior world. So whenever the inferior chiasma is affected, which means superior more than inferior means it indicates a inferior chiasmal lesion. So when you have an inferior chiasmal lesion means in this condition it is going to be a pituitary adenoma only in exam. Only pituitary adenoma can cause this picture. Supposedly if inferior world is affected more than the superior world which means they are affecting the inferior world fibers which are carried on the superior surface or on the upper surface of the optic chiasma and the optic tract which means it is a superior chiasmal lesion. Superior chiasmal lesion. Superior chiasmal lesion means it must be a supracellular lesion. It cannot be a cellular lesion. Pituitary adenoma is a cellular lesion. But definitely su superior chiasmal lesion means it must be a supracellular lesion. Very commonly it will be a craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma. Which must be a supracellular tumor. It's a supracellular tumor. Which we will discuss in some time about that. Anyway, we have a good discussion in the CNS also. But right now... We will discuss in small detail in the next upcoming section. Clear? So, which means craniopharyngioma is going to compress from the top and you know they are going to involve the superior fibers. So, they will produce inferior vision loss more than the superior vision loss. Alright? So, if I draw the vision, the what the patient sees and if you want to put a defect in this patient, the defect will be looking something like this which is this is what we refer to as a bitemporal. Amenopia. This bitemporal and binational amenopias are also referred as heteronymous amenopias. I am not going to discuss about those right now. And if you are going to affect the superior loss, superior vision more than inferior vision, obviously this goes towards a pituitary adenoma. All right. And if I am going to affect the inferior vision more than the superior vision, so obviously we know that this usually goes towards a cranium. All right. So, this is a very important thing to understand. So, both will cause bitemporal amenopia only, but which is affected more will tell you uh, what is the lesion and where is the lesion. Because bitemporal amenopia means itself, it is a central chiasmal lesion. That is all. It is a central chiasmal compression. Fine. I told you about the visual field defects. Definitely, they will result in visual field defects. Number one, we thought about this visual field defects. And number two, I also told the cranial nerves may be damaged. So, this Pituitary mass effect can result in cranial nerve palsies also. This cranial nerve palsy may result in uh, diplopia. Typically because they have this 3, 4, 5, 6 complex and the most common cranial nerve affected by enlarging pituitary lesion is the third cranial nerve. It's the most common cranial nerve that is affected which may lead to diplopia. Rare entity but still important. And third thing. This enlarging pituitary lesion may compress on the pituitary, normally functioning pituitary itself and they can cause pituitary hormone deficiencies. Clear? Pituitary hormone deficiencies like they can produce low growth hormone, they can produce low gonadotropins like FSH and LH and result in amenorrhea, they can result in low TSH production, they can result in low ACTH production resulting in low cortisol, secondary adrenal insufficiency and shock whenever the patient goes for some crisis states or they can even have a low ADH production causing diabetes. I didn't write it. This is possible here also in Sheehan syndrome also. It's not like they may not happen here. Low ADH can result in diabetes. But these are very rare. Usually these are anti issues, not post -tributary. But they can extend into the and post tributary also. Plus or minus. Clear? Saying diabetes and symptoms. Okay. All right. So among all this, if they ask you which is the first hormone to be replaced, what you will tell? I mean, in both these conditions, you might end up with the hormone deficiencies. A lot of hormones may be deficient in the anterior, maybe in the posterior pituitary also. But what is the first hormone you have to replace here? Very simple, no? Like, if you have a GHD, let us see one by one. If you have a growth hormone deficiency, in adults, 
are they going to result in any problem not much no like not much i'm not going to talk about the actual problem due to growth hormone right now i'll tell you in some time but is is are they going to result in any life threatening issues i don't think so low gonadotropin in adults only am i no any life threatening issue absolutely not low tsh low thyroxin it's very chronic acutely or in the long run also they're not going to result in any life threatening issue no not at all but remember one important point this is a secondary hypothyroidism is not a central hypothyroidism in a central hypothyroidism usually these patients don't go for mixed edema whenever you encounter a central hypothyroidism it's a very very important point only in primary hypothyroidism mixed edema is very common in secondary hypothyroidism mixed edema is extremely rare and in fact you don't get mixed edema in a secondary hypothyroidism so mixed edema coma again is a very very rare entity in secondary hypothyroidism or a central hypothyroidism so that's why i'm telling you it's not life threatening in this case low adh again is immediately not life threatening unless it is very severe but what is definitely life threatening is low cortisol surely life threatening because cortisol being a stress hormone if you don't have cortisol definitely the patient is going to die during times of stress because they cannot cope up with the stress see the adrenal chapter to understand how cortisol is important during stressful scenarios clear very 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 important point so again life threatening again even in these patients with apoplexy the most important is the cortisol if you lose the cortisol they are prone for shock and hypotension during stress that is the reason by whatever may be the cause of hypotyroidism my first hormone to be replaced will be hydrocortisone what is hydrocortisone it's very simple hydrocortisone is nothing but a synthetic cortisol we are having cortisol isn't it so cortisol in pharmacological form you call it as hydrocortisone that's all it's so just a cortisol that's all so that's given in tablet form or injection form that's hydrocortisone so that's the first treatment that you have to give in any hypopituitarism case or any adrenal insufficiency case or any hypopituitarism case whatever may be the cause the first treatment i'm going to prescribe is hydrocortisone this is not to reduce the inflammation or reduce the edema it's to actually replace the cortisol which is low in these patients that is the idea so this is the difference between apoplexy and shihan syndrome subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from preplada